Take our Bibles. We're in the book of James today. We're in the second chapter, beginning in verse 14, and we'll go through the end of the chapter, verse 26. So James chapter 2, I'm going to follow along with you as you're reading from your scripture, and you're going to follow along with me as I'm reading as well from the screen, and we'll see what insights God gives to us. There's a particular verse that I think is most significant in this morning's text, and it's the first verse of this section of James chapter 2, verse 14. Here's what it says. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So as you know, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to people in the church. James is writing to a group of people who have been really oppressed in multiple ways they have been scattered abroad and they are facing real significant issues but he's writing to them about the authenticity of their faith and in this case he's saying if you have faith if you claim to have faith but you don't have works that go along with that what good is that faith now if you remember in chapter one and even in the beginning of chapter two he is giving us authenticity test He's asking us, is your faith genuine? Is it it certain? And he's testing us along the way. And some of those tests, we might just fly right through. And others were like, oh, wow, never really thought of it in those terms. And so we're grateful that God is giving us that kind of an exam so that we can ready our heart and prepare our heart to receive the movement that he wants in our spirit. Now, whether it was John the Baptist or Jesus or it was one of the other apostles one of the New Testament writers they were all communicating about the gospel and they were warning people by giving them tests about the authenticity of their faith you know to proclaim faith is pretty easy even if it's false faith it's easily proclaimed so the Lord Jesus has made attempts along the way as he's proclaiming about faith to have people test their faith And James, as you know, is the brother to our Lord, and he certainly heard a number of those teachings, and he too is calling out in the same way by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he's using sharp words and questions like, uh, go back to that pre, no, you're, you're on the right spot. If someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that faith, a faith without works, can that really save them? Is this just a proclamation? Is this a claim? So there's no mincing of words with that, is there? I mean, there's no beating around the bush. He is just jabbing us with this question about genuine faith. And that makes sense because if you go all the way back to the precursor to Christ's ministry here on earth, John, the cousin of our Lord, was asking some of the same things and making some of those same proclamations. In fact, he was calling out for people to live in a life of repentance And in Matthew chapter 3, when John saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to the baptism, he asked them this. Actually, he makes a statement to them. Now, just picture, if you will, John is out in the wilderness. He's baptizing there at the Jordan, and people are coming out of Jerusalem, and they're making their way through the Negev to where John is baptizing. They're coming by large numbers to hear the proclamation that John is giving. And many of them are making confession of their sin and repenting of that, meaning that they're turning away from their sin and they're turning back to the law of God. They're turning back to the way and the will and the word of God. But when John sees the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, he makes a statement to them. Now, when we see Pharisees and Sadducees, we ought to think, okay, these are religious people who make religious claims and who have religious practice. And he's calling out to them, how'd you like your preacher to say this to you? You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Right, so he's, he's alerting to them to this idea that your heart has not changed. You're as evil as you were from the start, from your birth. Can I remind us that we were born into sin? Uh, Kay and I are keeping our one month, excuse me, one year old grandson. And we realize, of course, as all you folks that are my age or older have realized, you know why God gives them to you when you're young, because <laughs> he is wearing us out. But we are enjoying it. But you know what we've we know from our boys and from our grandson you don't have to teach them to be a sinner 
they automatically come prepackaged to sin right and so unless God changes us unless he transforms us we are going to remain in our sin now here's people who were religious proclaiming religion proclaiming faith proclaiming practice but yet John says they are a brood of vipers why because they don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance their life the life work of repentance is not being uh, they're not living that out so don't presume to say to yourself we have Abraham as our father in other words we have a heritage of faith don't presume that that's going to get you into heaven every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so he's saying it's the fruit bearing that is essential to show whether you have valid faith or not so we have some apple trees on our property and there's a variety of apple trees one of them among those that we have is called molly's delicious and evidently molly's delicious and that is an apple tree that deer really like because they will bypass the other apple trees that we have but molly's delicious they're like western sizzling buffet they're going after it right so of the four molly's delicious that we have we're now down to two now one of them was my fault one of them I actually hit with a piece of equipment and I've learned whatever you hit with equipment that thing loses the equipment always wins including if it's me the other one I don't know why it died it just died but I've got two that are struggling and it's because they have been nipped just constantly with deer now I spray around those trees putrefied egg whites did you know you could buy putrefied egg yolks on Amazon <laughs> you can uh, and uh, it's it's not it's not pleasant but it keeps them away from Molly's delicious evidently it's not so delicious if putrefied egg whites are all around I say all that to tell you I knew that two of the four trees were in trouble and the two remaining are in trouble because they stopped bearing fruit and they stopped producing foliage and then the branches started to die and I had no other solution other than to cut them and burn them so what James is pointing out to those Sadducees and Pharisees who are coming out expressing their faith they're coming out to the wilderness to hear what's going on to see the effect of what's happening with John's teaching he says you are still as evil as ever and the evidence is in your fruit bearing the evidence is in the lack of fruit in your life or the evidence is what are you living is it an expression of repentance or is it not and he's warning them saying that it's not so a claim to faith does not make someone spiritually alive James wants us to get that with flashing warning lights he wants us to understand a claim to faith doesn't mean anything if you don't have the works of faith the evidences of faith as well so the Pharisees and the Sadducees proclaimed that they had faith they had the heritage of faith they had the practice of faith they had the look of faith but they were not men of faith and John knew that and he was calling them out and he was pointing to their lack of repentance their life was not one of repentance so you can conclude with me this summary statement that genuine salvation is by grace through faith all right this is God's gift it's grace it's through faith he even gives us the gift of faith that we might respond to that gift with faith so genuine salvation is by grace through faith and it is evident by transformed living and the transformed living is we have chosen in Christ to turn from our sin and turn to his righteousness to his right ways to his right word to his right will there is a change and if you don't see a change, if you don't see a change by the transformation of Christ within you, evident, demonstratively so, then James is saying, you need to test yourself. You need to test your faith to see if it is genuine. Now, Jesus said much of the same thing. John the Baptist gave the warning. And if, if you remember, John's, John's whole purpose was to identify who Jesus Christ is. He's the Messiah, the Son of God promised. And when when he identified him then John takes a step back and Jesus takes the step forward as his public ministry begins and as Jesus is proclaiming and teaching and he's doing miracles there were people that were following him and in this case as John 2 says when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast 
Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So again, get this in your mind. Here they are in Jerusalem, which is the holy city, right? If you're religious in the day, Jerusalem is the place to be. Even if you live outside of Jerusalem during the feast and the festivals, there were times through the year, Passover being a significant one, where people were flushing into the city. And they were coming, and the city was multiplying many times over in its population. So here's Jesus in the, in the city of Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and he's doing signs. What are these signs? These are the signs that the prophets foretold he would do. Here's what the Messiah will do when he comes. For instance, when he is identified as one who can give sight to the blind, nobody else can do that. When the one who is the Messiah comes, he will give sight to the blind and he will make the lame to walk and the dumb to, to be able to speak. And all those signs point back to the Old Testament prophets who were identifying who the Messiah would be when he comes, that he would declare and do these things. So there are many who are religious, right? They're in Jerusalem. They're religious. They're at the time of the height of religion and they're seeing Jesus do signs and they are believing you think, okay, they're on track, right? But look at this next verse, verse 24. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So although they had everything going for them, they're in the right place at the right time, seeing the right things and even believing the right things, Jesus did not entrust himself to them because they were not people given to him in faith. He didn't need somebody to tell them about that, to, to tell him about that. He knew their heart. All right, so if you're here or if you're in life and you're trying your best to make it where you're doing better, you're uh, living your life in a more righteous way, you're living your life in a more religious way, Jesus is not listening to your words. He's not even identifying the things that you're doing as much as he is looking into your heart. And he knows our hearts. And he is entrusting himself to us who are given to him uh, in our heart that we might be saved. So Jesus proclaims very much the same thing. Belief alone is not going to save anyone. So as John recorded religious people in the city proclaiming the same things that you and I would probably proclaim Jesus wants us to know that belief alone will not save you now that's an important sentence for us because many in the south will say all you need to do is believe but Jesus wants us to know the fullness of the gospel message and belief alone in him will not save you you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can believe that he is born of a virgin. You can believe he lived a righteous life. You can believe he died a horrible death. And you can believe that he resurrected unto a glorious life and still not be saved. Belief alone will not save you. And James is echoing those same words when he is making his point in James chapter 2, verse 17 and 19. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even demons believe and shudder. So belief alone is, is not the, the key thing. Demons believe. believe in, demons know the triune God. Demons know the sovereignty of God. De, demons know the, that God is the ruler. They, they know that and they shudder at that. They even believe. So belief alone is not the big deal. That's the reason why he goes back a chapter in chapter 1 verse 22 he says you need to be doers of the word not just hearers alone deceiving yourself so don't just hear it don't just believe it but be transformed by it and do it that's what he's calling for us to do Jesus of course repeatedly made those same statements he's talking about fruitful life transformed lives remember when he gives the parable of the soil uh, some would call it the parable of the sower and the sower casts the seed, which is the word of God, right? And that seed, some of it falls into thorny areas, some falls on the pathway, some falls amongst the rocks, and others fall on good soil, and it takes root. And Jesus says of that soil where it hits and it takes root, 
that that seed will actually bear, and it will bear some 100-fold, some 60-fold, some 30-fold. The big deal is that when the gospel goes out and it is received, it is meant to be fruit-bearing. It's not just meant to be received. It's meant to be transformational. You don't plant corn just for the sake of the plant. You plant corn for the sake of the grain. You want the ears of corn, right? You want two per stalk if you can get it, and you want them to be good and hardy. You don't plant a garden for the sake of, oh, isn't it pretty, all those plants. No, you plant the garden because you want the harvest. And Jesus plants his word, the gospel in us, that he might receive a harvest from us, 160, 30 fold. That's what he's requiring of us and all the others where it falls on the path of the rocky uh, area or amongst the thorns. All of that gets choked or, or taken away or it withers away. All of that is unproductive. And that is not what Christ has called us to be and to do. That's not what he's saving us unto. The writer of Hebrews says it in a different way. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says this, Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness about which no one will see the Lord. So strive for peace and for holiness because without that, you will not see the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm interested in seeing the Lord because where the Lord is, there is peace. Where the Lord is, there is grace. Where the Lord is, there is love. Where the Lord is, there is rest. So that's the life that I want. Where the Lord is, there is no COVID-19. Amen to that? And no cancer and no depression and no disease. That's where the Lord is. That's where I want to be. Anybody want to be in that place and see the Lord? To see Him is to be like Him, right? We will be made in His glorious image when we see Him. So certainly we want to see the Lord. So who sees the Lord? The people who strive for peace. Why? Because they have been transformed by the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace has come into their life they were once rebellious against God, but Christ has come to establish peace with God. Christ has come to take away those things, sin and transgressions that keep us removed from God. He removes them from us, he cleanses us from those things, and he gives to us righteousness that we might be presented before God and be at peace with him. The word shalom is a good greeting. Shalom, peace to you because it is a reminder that God gives us pre peace and the peace prince is Jesus now when you and I are transformed by the prince of peace then we strive for peace with others it's part of the fruit bearing of being in life with the prince of peace and when we are seeking after holiness the word here might be sanctified as well when we're seeking holiness we're doing so because we have been made new in Christ Jesus he has transformed us so that we might be righteous and in that righteous way that we are in Christ with a new birth from above we have holiness which is the working of righteousness in us so someone who strives for peace in every way is one who has been transformed by the peace giver and one who seeks after holiness in pursuit of holiness is the one who has been made holy and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that is evident in the salvation. So there's no salvation for a reviler and there is no salvation, genuine faith without evidence of God's sanctifying work in us. If you're living today like you live before you claim salvation, if you see the same person and the expressions of that life, then you have not been genuinely saved. That's what the Bible says. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You and I have to be made holy by Christ Jesus, and we live out the expression of that holy, righteous nature which is within us. John MacArthur said it verily, Fairly, fairly succinctly when he said a profession of faith that produces no sanctification is dead faith that's about as clear as you get isn't it that you and I ought to be in a process of sanctification being made holy he went on to say in fact this was in a message uh, sometimes I do some strange things like recently I've gotten in a habit of listening to the scripture as I'm going to sleep or listening to someone who speaks biblical truth uh, while I'm going to sleep and I was listening to a MacArthur message on this particular passage that I knew I'd be teaching in a couple of weeks and 
as I was sort of drifting asleep, I heard him say something that made me perk up. I'm like, man, I need to capture, I need to go back and capture that. And then later, as I was reading uh, one of his commentaries verbatim, he had written that out. So uh, I, I'm going to read this section to you. This is what got my attention uh, one night a couple of weeks ago. Listen to what he says. As, many, as in many other times in history, the church today desperately needs to recognize and deal with the soul-damning idea that mere acknowledgement of gospel facts as being true is sufficient for salvation. Now catch that. He's saying it is a soul-damning idea to think that merely knowing the facts about the gospel is equal to salvation. Now, let me go a little further in his quote. We must clearly and forcefully counter the deception and delusion that knowing and accepting the truth about Jesus Christ is equivalent to having saving faith in him. So we have this way in the South where we'll try to convince people the gospel facts and then lead them to a prayer about those facts, that does not bring genuine salvation. Now, it might be a step toward salvation, but that in and of itself is not how we are genuinely saved. It's simply helping somebody to acknowledge the truths about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saving faith is realizing our sin in contrast to God's holiness. God's law has been issued and we have been disobedient lawbreakers to that word. And we recognize that in the midst of our salvation that we are sinners in need of God's mercy. And recognizing that God has extended his mercy, we trust him because he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, into this world to pay the penalty for our sin, for our infractions against him, by dying on the cross with God's justice being exercised and being placed in the ground and then gloriously resurrected on the third day. Jesus bore our sin so that we might have the penalty of that sin paid for by him. To believe that new life is available through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is to be in the process of salvation and then to respond that we will deny ourselves, take up the cross of Jesus Christ and follow him for the rest of our days. Now we're engaging in salvation. And God knows our heart in that. God knows our desire in that. It's not just that we're responding with words of faith, but we are responding with a life of faith, with the genuine depth of heart in that faith. So both of these truths ought to be illustrated that works does not equate to salvation. You're not going to work your way unto salvation. Uh, that's pretty clear in the scripture. Uh, as it says down in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace, this gift of God that you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not the result of works. None of us can boast about that because works is not leading us or giving to us salvation but flip that around and you'll see that if you are genuinely saved there will be works of righteousness there will be works in fact James 2 says it this way by faith by itself if it does not have works it's dead so we ought to emphasize you're not going to work your way to salvation and we ought to emphasize if you are saved it ought to be evident in your works those two ought to be emphasized today in the church, and certainly here at Meadowbrook, we want to do that. So James, Jesus, John, other New Testament writers, they were all emphatically declaring that a person deceives him or herself if they merely know the facts about the gospel, even proclaim the facts about the gospel, and are not transformed, demonstratively so, by the gospel surrendering to the truth of the gospel is surrendering to the word the will and the way of christ and that transformation is going to be evident that's the hundredfold sixtyfold thirtyfold evidence of fruit that is being born in us now somebody might say well randy does james and john uh, james and paul not see eye to eye on this because when you look at romans chapter 3 verse 28 paul says for we hold that, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. 
So, so Paul's saying, now wait, it's about faith, not about works. And James is saying, oh, it's about faith and works. So are they in contradiction with one another? And I would say, no, they're actually looking to do two different groups. Paul is looking this way to people who are unsaved. And he's saying to them, hey, if you're thinking that you're going to do works of the law in order to accomplish your salvation, you're off base. It's not that at all. You are not going to be able to be justified by your works. You're going to be justified by faith. James is looking this way to people who are saved. He's looking to brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's saying to them, if you're declaring that you're saved, but you don't have works from your salvation, then your declaration means nothing. So they're both in jive with one another, right? They're synced up with one another. They're just talking to two separate groups of people. Both James and Paul will, will claim salvation is by faith and it ought to be evident in our works. You're not going to work your way to salvation, but when you're saved, it ought to be evident in your works. So we could, um, we could go back to those passages and just repeat them, but, but we won't do that. Paul is just matter-factly saying that if you're unsaved, your works is not going to save you. Now, the unsaved shouldn't think that that works will save and the saved shouldn't think that works aren't important in your salvation they actually prove out the genuineness of your faith now go back with me a little bit to that same passage of ephesians 2 8 so it's by grace you've been saved through faith we've got that it's a gift of god it's not of our works but now look what he says for if we're his then we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for what good works now you're seeing Paul say a lot of the same things that James is saying. And God even prepared those things beforehand that you and I should walk in them. So you're saved. And in the salvation, God has prepared already before your salvation that these works should be accomplished. This life should be lived. This righteousness, this word, this mission. God has already prepared all that and has an expectation that you and I are going to pursue those things. Now, let's just walk through the text. I want to make sure that we read it in its entirety. Walk through it, and I'll just mention a few brief points, uh, and then we'll close. Genuine faith, as I've already said, is more than just professing words. So if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, James is saying, can that kind of faith save you? A faith that doesn't have any righteous works? No. Secondly, genuine faith is compassionately active so if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So you can see that in your mind. It's winter, and the church is gathered together. It's pretty cold, and somebody has less clothes than needed to keep warm and they're skipping meals because they don't have enough to eat, and it's obvious that they are lacking in food and so when the gathered saints get together and they're worshiping together they're reading scripture together they're encouraging one another in the scripture and then it's time to leave and somebody says to the person who is lacking in clothing and lacking in food go in peace be warmed and filled but doesn't give them anything he said well, what good is that that didn't make sense Active faith, works of faith, ought to be compassionate. There's no compassion in saying, be warmed and filled. I had a philosophy professor at my undergrad school, Sanford, and I was not very good in philosophy. I don't mind telling you, don't think well in the abstract, never have. Geometry, no good. Uh, philosophy, I was not good at it. And he would close every class as I'm sitting there confused go in peace be warmed and filled <laughs> as if to say i know that you don't have what you need but go in peace anyway and i was not in peace my peace was god please just give me a c and let me get out of this class anybody ever take a class like that yeah <laughs> maybe it's all of your classes like that yeah i've never had to show anybody my grades i've shown them the paper that i graduated but nobody's ever asked for the grades uh, actually, the Lord bless me uh, somewhat. So anyway, compassion is essential for this working of salvation. So he says, 
This is similar to faith by itself. If it doesn't have works, it's dead. So our faith, saying something and not really meaning it, saying something and not doing anything about it, obviously those are mere words. They don't hit. They don't register. They're not genuine. So he's using that as an example. Everybody would say, well, who would do that? That's really cruel for somebody to tell somebody who lacks a coat and lacks food to go and be warm and be full. What cruel person would do that? And what James is saying, that's the illustration of somebody who's professing faith and not actually demonstrating works of faith. That we ought to be working from our salvation and it ought to be evident to other people. So could I ask you, just in light of today's conversations, if genuine faith is compassionate, how does that change the conversations that we're having today in light of all the cultural issues that have escalated to a really difficult place? What does this say about racism? What does this say about you and me moving towards minorities? What does this say as we might disagree with some people. Can we still have compassion in a genuineness of faith, though we may disagree? Can we have enough compassion that we would listen to what they're saying? To those we're opposed to, who are tearing down and destroying, can we have enough compassion to recognize that they may still be a brood of vipers like you and I were born as a brood of vipers? but Jesus Christ has transformed us? Can we have enough compassion to introduce them to the one who can bring transformation, who is ushering in justice to a kingdom, to the world, without having to go out in the streets and scream for it? Can we introduce them to him? That's compassion. And this kind of passage ought to make a difference for today in how we're thinking about people, how we're talking to people, and how we are engaging them. You don't have to side with them in order to have compassion for them. And they don't have to side with you in order to give you compassion as a brother and sister in Christ. Is your faith being expressed today with compassion? And then genuine faith expresses righteous works. So James says in a sort of a hypothetical way, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, what faith apart from works is is useless? He's going to give us an illustration or two in just a moment. But he's helping us to recognize that if you have faith, it ought to be expressed in your works. And you've got to be real careful with this because some might just make the emphasis on works. James is not doing that. We are not communicating or advocating a social gospel. You know, social gospel diminishes the sin and the consequences of sin that you and I are lawbreakers of the holy God's law and his command. The social gospel takes sin and recategorizes it to all the ills, social ills in the world and tries to apply it to that and not really deal with the consequences of sin, namely that we are against a holy God who demands justice against every lawlessness. So we're not just talking about works as if works is gonna bring a transformation in anybody's heart. What he's saying is, I have faith and I will show you my faith by my works. I have faith and my friends ought to see the evidence of my faith by my works. I have faith and my family ought to know I have faith by my works. The way I speak to them and deal with them and serve them. I have faith and my community ought to know there's a guy who has works of God, works of righteousness in his life. They ought not have to question that. So James is saying, show me your works. I'll show you my works through my faith. My faith will give the works be the evidence of works which leads me to that next uh, section of the scripture Um, by the way I just looked in my notes to remind me that uh, faith is essential for salvation it's always an expression works are always the expression of righteousness and if you're talking about salvation in the past tense all the time then you might be in the wrong direction in other words if you're saying oh I was saved when I was eight 
which I can say that. Or I was baptized when I was a little girl. Or I prayed the prayer with so-and-so. If your faith declarations are always in the past tense and not the present tense, acknowledging that there's a future tense to it as well, then you're in trouble. So it ought to be in the past, yes, but it ought to be in the present, yes, and it ought to be fulfilled in the future, yes. If all you can do is point, oh, I remember when, and it's not active today, then James says, time out. You need to test that. All right, now I'll go to this last little point here. Genuine faith includes works that glorify God and encourage others. And he gives a couple of illustrations. One is about Abraham. And he was justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac to the altar uh, because of his faith. Let me just go back and hit the narrative. So God made a promise to Abram uh, just because God wanted to declare his promise and be glorified in his promise. It wasn't because Abram was anything good. In fact, he was not good. He was a server of other gods living apart from God. And God came to him and said to him, hey, I want you to go to this land. And he did. And God came to him and made a promise to him because of his faith that he would make him into a nation and through him he would bless all the nations of the world now that's pretty cool the the issue how are you going to be made a nation when you don't even have a descendant and at that point he had no descendants he's an old man and he has no sons no daughters but yet God has declared to him a promise and if you remember that promise was fulfilled when he was a hundred years old now He thought maybe Eleazar was going to be the one, his servant. Maybe he'll be the heir to all that I possess. And God said, oh, no, you're going to have a son, and it will be from you. It won't be from your servant. It won't be from your maiden, your wife's maiden. It will be from you. And he had that son. His name was Isaac. And man, did he ever love that boy. One day, God came to him and said, hey, I want you and Isaac to go to the mount that I will show to you. And he revealed to him, he wanted him to go to Mount Moriah. The next day, Abram loaded up the donkey, brought the wood, brought the fire with his son and two servants. And when they were drawing near three days away from the place that God said, take your son and offer him as a burnt offering there, when they were three days out, he says to his servants, you stay here, the boy and I are going over there and we'll be back. Isaac questioned him along the way. I see the wood. I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? You remember what he said? With great faith, God will provide the sacrifice. With great faith, you stay here, servants. The boy and I will go over there and we'll be back. With great faith, he believed he would be back. Sure, if God called him to plunge the knife into his son, he believed that God would raise his son. You say, would he really do that? Well, he certainly did with his only begotten son. Yeah, he believed that. And with great faith, that work was demonstrated to the point that you and I have the fulfillment of Scripture. And we give glory to God in that, don't we? We're encouraged by that. How many thousands of years has it been since that took place? And even today, I'm encouraged by the faith of Abraham and the faith of Isaac as well, uh, who was not a young boy. He was a young man when he was offered up and willfully did so there's another narrative that James points to it's Rahab and you can't get any more opposite than Abraham and Rahab right I mean Abraham was a friend of God Rahab was a prostitute and yet James uses her as an illustration if you remember as the conquest was beginning as Israel was taking the the land that God had promised to them as they were taking the land they had come across a couple of adversaries and they destroyed those adversaries dispossessed them of the land they took possession of that and Jericho the people of Jericho understood God had given them the land and he was making good on his promise well Joshua had sent a couple of spies into Jericho and this woman named Rahab a prostitute brought them into her home And she had understood that God had made the promise to Israel that they would be the possessors of the land and that they would be destroyed there in Jericho. So she made a pact with them. I'll help you, but you help my family when God gives you this city. And they made a pact. And when she helped them to escape, 
the people in that city so that they might go back to Joshua they made a truce that if you put this red cord out the window then we'll know that that's where you and your father and your siblings will be and you will not be killed it was faith that God had spoken to those people about that place and that she acted in faith with those words that we give glory to God do you know how how God saw that he saw that as being such a big deal of faith and works that he put her in the line of the Messiah one of four women mentioned in the messianic line of Jesus isn't that incredible so when it comes down to it God is telling us that he's offering grace salvation to us if we'll extend in faith to receive that and then live out the expression of that saved life that we can actually glorify God and encourage other people and that's the way I want to leave us today that God has called us to be saved and that ought to be proclaimed and received by us and trusted by us and then lived out this new life lived out through us in a way that God is glorified and other people are encouraged now James ends this section with the same way as he started for as the body apart from the spirit is dead so also faith apart from works is dead anytime you hear redundancy in the scripture it's like the Holy Spirit is saying take a look at this this is incredibly important don't let this one slip so the only time that my body is going to be dead is the time that my spirit is not in it there's coming a day and God knows when it will be that this heart will stop beating and in that moment my body will die and to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord my spirit will be with him you'll put my body six feet underground but then another day is coming when my body will be resurrected and it will be reunited with my spirit in heaven what James is pointing to is if your spirit has left the body then your body is dead and if your faith has no works so your faith is dead that's pretty pointed isn't it and so he's giving us that alert it's good for us to receive that to ask the questions Lord is it evident right now that I am saved and that I'm walking in the salvation is it evident in my words my compassion my actions works of righteousness is it evident that I am saved James would say it ought to be evident by the works the works of righteousness that you're doing now maybe you're here today and you say there's no evidence of that whatsoever I want it I want to trust Jesus I want to be transformed by him I want his righteousness in me then that my friends is the way you engage in faith Lord I need it there's nothing I can offer to you only thing I can offer to you is my sin and my regret and my failures I give you all of who I am and here's what God will do in Christ Jesus he will wash you of all those sins he's so faithful to do that wash you from that and he will change the record he will erase the certificate of debt which was held against you because of your sin and he will put into you the righteous declaration of Jesus Christ the credit of Christ now belongs to you and you can be gloriously radically saved and transformed and begin to walk in a way by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you a walk in a way of righteousness I'm asking you to that to receive that and to walk in that truth that God might be glorified and other people might be encouraged in your walk so help us Lord I pray as we take this scripture and receive it I pray Lord that you would help us to receive it with all the truth and all the faith that your grace gift enables us and I pray that it would be transformational that this would be the beginning of something incredibly new altogether new and the evidence would be in our lives I pray for fruitful living empowered by you only by you and I pray that you find it in willing recipients in the name of Jesus amen